the, the ultimate goal here, and why we're even talking about this, is if we are looking to create as believable performance as we can with our virtual instruments, then we have to get in there and start adjusting these articulations. Because players do. Live players can effortlessly go from spiccato to staccato to flautando to legato and just moving all around. And so, yes, it's time consuming. Yes, it is somewhat fiddly, especially if you're getting into like key switches and all this kind of thing. And it could be a real pain. And it, it, there's forensic level of detail to it, but I think that it pays off. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Qs podcast, your weekly insight into all things production, library, and sync music. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the audio on the go, thank you so much for joining me. I know you have a ton of options out there, so just know that I really do appreciate you. Also, I appreciate our family, friends, and neighbor subscribers who really do keep all of this going. And if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52 Qs and also get a ton of extra perks like workshops, live streams, and pitching to real libraries, then be sure to tune in a little bit later in today's episode because I'm going to be telling you exactly how you can join us at 52 Qs. Uh, as far as today's episode, we've got a good episode lined up for you today, and uh, I'm going to be unpacking orchestral articulations in the DAW. Namely, for, for those folks out there watching or listening who maybe didn't come up in orchestra or through high school band or whatever, you might not know, like, what's the difference between spiccato and staccato? And what's the difference between, you know, flautando and consordino, right? So we're going to open up BBCSO, which has a ton of fantastic articulations, and we're going to look across the string section, the brass section, and the woodwind section. I'm going to unpack and demonstrate the different articulations to give you an idea of what they sound like and maybe what they could be used for. So that is coming up a little bit later. And then after that, I'm going to be unpacking uh, my latest cue, which is a plucky hip hop dramedy cue. It's called Obfuscating on Thin Ice, and it actually features melodica run through a rotary cab, and it sounds like a B3. So you want to stick around for all of that. But first, how was my week? It's been it's been a really busy week and not busy for Dave the composer even though I did I did finish a cue this week already so that's that feels good and I feel accomplished having done that but Dave the publisher along with Mrs 52 cues who does a, a giant amount of the work um, has we, we've released four albums this week uh, and they are albums going up to my publisher for CBS sports which means like NFL and PGA and all that and four albums that we put together through the briefing room over in the 52 Qs community. Now, I don't talk a ton about the briefing room necessarily, but it's one of the perks for our family subscribers. And it's a way for, for people to pitch to real libraries and get mentoring and feedback. We have multiple rounds of submissions with video feedback and Folks submit their cues to our live feedback sessions that we do via Zoom. They might get a feedback video. And so, and so we run briefs all the time, at least once a month. This, this, this month, it just so happens that we have two briefs happening. One is for an investigation tension album, and another one is for a folk pop vocal album that we're putting together for two, two different libraries. And the four albums that we just published or, or sent along up to the publisher, they were all for the upcoming NFL on CBS season. And we had a vocal album that had pop vocals as well as rap vocals. We had a rock album for highlights. We had a f funk kind of dance, EDM kind of pop album. That's going to be for bumpers and transitions. And we have a hip hop album that is for graphics and also for highlights. So four albums 
out the door. Uh, we, I, I, I forget how many cues that we have, something like 40 or 50 cues that we've got put together that have, have all their metadata wrangled and uh, artwork done and all of that. And that's a huge shout out to Mrs. 52 Cues, who is the deliverable wrangler here in the briefing room and at 52 Cues. And so a big, big thank you to her. But it's just been a really busy week. And I remember I remember when I first started in the production music industry, I had a friend of mine who was uh, was one one of my my mentors, and uh, shout out to Steve Cox. I hope you're doing well, man. And I remember at one point he wasn't writing a bunch because he was getting more and more involved in the publishing side of things. And I remember thinking how weird that. That was like, how, how can you just stop writing, right? Like, this is what you do. And he's an amazing guitarist uh, and a really good composer. But at the time, you know, like 10 years ago, I, I really didn't get how you could just stop writing. But considering how it's really been, especially within the last year, because the, the briefing room has turned one year, which puts me in the position of kind of in a publishing role. You know, it's it's like I'm I'm I am managing and producing these albums, and I'm not necessarily writing on them. But there is so much so much detail. There is getting feedback into composers, sending their things along. There is doing follow ups. You know, at the briefing room, we have multiple rounds of submissions with follow ups, and um, and and I get it now. <laughs> Like I, and it's not just paperwork, it's just the producing of it, the executive producing of it, I should say. And and chasing down, yes, metadata that's missing an IPI number or a file name was messed up, or or uh I didn't get the correct deliverable, or uh the headroom isn't isn't right, or we were not hitting our target loudness or our peaks and all of that. And so there's so many little details that from one composer going to a publisher doesn't feel like like if if I miss an underscore in a title or something like that. This is just a one-to-one relationship with me sending it to the publisher. But from the publishing perspective, it's a lot of little tiny details coming coming at you all at once. And so I get it. I get why. First of all, I get why composers go into publishing. Because it's, I, I am fulfilled by empowering other composers and providing them an opportunity to have their music get air, get air on television. And we do, we, we have folks who submitted into the briefing room program and they have made air. So that, that is amazing. But also how it just feels like a natural progression out of where you start as a composer. Because you make relationships and you build, you build relationships with either music supervisors or editors or other publishers, and they, you kind of come alongside them. So I'm excited about, you know, what the future has in store. And if the next year is anything like the first year of the briefing room, then man, I think Shannon and I need to need to hold on because it's gonna it's gonna hit like a rocket. But I'm here for it. Just as long as I still make time to write. Because when I was talking to Steve and he was, you know, lamenting about not having time to write, I, I could sense there was almost, for lack of a better term, and, and Steve, if you're watching, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but there was a sense of loss. There was almost a, 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 a gri- grief to that. And yeah, I just felt like he was bummed out about that, like a melancholy about not having time to write. And I don't want to get there. I don't want to get so busy on the publishing side of things that I I forget how to write, which I don't, or I stop finding time to write. So, but this week I did uh, put a cue together and it came together pretty fast, actually. And we're going to listen to that a little bit later in today's episode. But our main topic today, our main topic is talking 
all about articulations, specifically articulations that us MIDI composers are likely to run into as we are working with our virtual instruments, whether it's Symphobia or Berlin strings or LA scoring strings or Spitfire. I'm using BBCSO, but I think it's really important to understand the different articulations around the orchestra, specifically strings, brass, and woodwinds. And the brass and woodwinds actually share a lot of the same articulations, but I wanna play those for you. But it can be really confusing, especially since many times they have similar sounding names like spiccato versus staccato versus legato versus pizzicato. Like if, if you're not super familiar with this world, this can all seem really confusing. So that's what I want to do today. Just take a very simple overview look at the different type of articulations that us DAW composers often run into. So like I said, I'm going to be showing you these things in BBCSO, talking about them, giving you a little bit of definition, demonstrating them here. Like I don't have a bunch of MIDI pulled up, but I'm just going to play them on the keyboard and tell you kind of how I would use them. So I'm using BBCSO, which is the BBC Symphony Orchestra from Spitfire. And I think I, I think it's one of the best kind of total orchestral solutions out there, especially if you are wanting to get into more granular control over the orchestra. Now, whenever I do ensemble type, type passages, I will generally bring something like Symphobia to the table, uh, or even, you know, if you have the Albions, those are really, really good. But the Albions and, and even Symphobia don't have the deep bench of articulations that you're going to find in a, a more complete solution like the BBC SO. And it's all of these articulations that keep the price of expensive libraries higher than some libraries. You're paying for one of two things when you're when you're really paying top dollar for a library. You're either paying for mic positions, which BBCSO has a, 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 a an exhaustive list of mic positions, or you're paying for articulations. In the case of the BBCSO library, you're actually getting both an exhaustive amount of mic positions and an exhaustive amount of articulations. So let's let's start off with just the very first one, this is the default patch, which loads in with a lot of these libraries. And that is, this is the legato patch. Now, in some libraries, like with stock logic libraries, this legato doesn't mean quite the same thing as you would find it in other libraries. But the term legato, when you're dealing with virtual instruments, usually means a single line. So you can only play, for the most part, one note at a time. But the good news is, is that the notes are connected to where they sound really believable when you play from one note to another note. They sound really, really believable. Uh, but note that I can't, I can't, I'm like I'm trying to do two notes at one time and it's kind of fighting trying to figure out what to do. And so it sounds really good. And what makes the legato work is they record a sustained sound and they record another sustained sound between like an A and an E. And they also record the transition going from A to E. So if, uh, if a, a, a player would play from an A, I'm sorry, an A up to an E, kind of going back and forth, and you can hear there's a little legato transition in between it. And I can even lean into a portamento, and the portamento is when you glide or slide from one note to the other. Like some synths will call this glide, but the uh, the orchestral uh, academic way to describe that, the, the musically appropriate way would be a portamento. Here's a little scoop. Now, 
But legato patches in libraries, whether it's strings or brass or woodwinds, looks to create the most believable single line from the sound that you are using. And it does that by limiting it to one sound and then programming the transitions programming those transitions in between. Now, this is different than you might see sustained. Like a sustained sound here in BBCSO would be what they call the long sound. And the long sound is essentially the legato, but without all the transitional material in between it. And so you can hear versus the legato. And then with the portamento, it just doesn't sound as good. However, long sounds can be really, really great for kind of thickening. You can stack. And it sounds pretty decent. Is it going to stand up to the believability test when it's so exposed? Probably not. And in which case, if you if you had string pads, which are you know multiple string notes just kind of holding out uh, holding out their notes, then you can put a legato on top of those on top on top of those sustained sounds. So the legato, just think of the legato as connecting the notes. And these long patches, you can play more than one note at a time, but it doesn't have that connective tissue in between each recorded sample. Now, here in BBCSO, we have two other long articulations, and one is called a C sword or CS, but it stands for consordino. And a, and a sordino uh, is like a little rubber mute that you put uh, on the strings, and it creates a a little bit softer it's almost it almost sounds like it almost sounds like you've you've uh like run a filter on it or something and so if we were to do our test Yeah, it just sounds a little softer, a little darker uh, because of that little rubber mute that they put over the strings, or I think it's like in between strings, which then brings us to a flautando. Now, a flautando is is very, it's very kind of a dry, like almost kind of like a raspy sound. And this is played near the fingerboard. This feels more delicate. Yeah, yeah, I like that sound. Now let's compare the longs. To the long consordino. To the flautando. And so if you are writing and you want a believable string line that is flowing on top, then you would use a legato. You can't stack notes, you can't play intervals, but it will give you a much more believable MIDI performance. If you want just full strings, full pads, multiple notes on top of each other, then you would use the longs. 
If you want it, the, the longs, but a little bit darker, you would use the CS or the Consordino. And if you wanted a, a more delicate, papery, kind of Icelandic string type sound, then you would probably go for the Flautondo. And those are the four primary long articulations that, that you will find. Now, we're going to have a few more kind of specialty, almost effect, uh, effect articulations coming up. But I want to start with those four long articulations. And let's talk about the next four articulations, which are going to be short articulations. So we have long articulations and short articulations. Let's start with actually with staccato. Now, staccato is a short note. but the notes are actually bowed up and down. But it's just the bow traveling a very, very short distance. So the bow is moving a short distance compared to the spiccato, which has the bow bouncing on the strings. So the player isn't like necessarily dragging the bow across the string, but they're bouncing across the string. And that sounds like this. Compared to the staccato. Back to spiccato. We'll speed it up a little bit. Which should give you a little bit of indication of when you would use each one. If you have a really fast passage, then you would not use staccato because the notes are just gonna be too mushy. versus spiccato, so that was staccato, here's spiccato. There's a lot more separation between each note. It's not as dark, it's a little featherier, right? Because you're just bouncing on top of the strings. But uh, if you want that kind of light, agile string work, then you're going you're gonna to want to reach for spiccato over staccato. Staccato works at, at slower tempos, and I don't mean necessarily slow, but you're not going to want to give staccato or use a staccato and have a really fast, long ostinato. They work really well. Right, so uh, I got a little, <laughs> I got a little Norman Bates there at the end, but uh, spiccato versus staccato. I think uh, spiccato is just bouncing; staccato is short bowing. And the next articulation is we should all be familiar with. This is called a pizzicato, and this is the string being plucked by the player. And we should, we should all be super familiar with this because it is the modern staple of dramedy music. And I know a lot of libraries are, are wanting to move away from pizzicato dramedy, but the editors and, and the viewers just expect it. It's kind of like if you want a bluesy feel, you're going to play, you know, dominant seven chords. If you want a, a dramedy feel, then just load up some pizzicato strings. It just just kind of works. Yep. So that is pizzicato. Now there's another pizzicato technique that we'll talk about here in just a second. And then the, the last of the main kind of articulations, the short articulations, is going to be, it's going to be a call lineo, which is when you strike the strings with the wooden part of the bow. 
Colinho. Right? It's not a very pretty sound, but it sounds really nice kind of across the orchestra. If you get, get everybody doing that, uh, you can get some Colenio uh, clacks for uh, like trailer music, big hits. They go really nicely, especially uh, the double basses and the cellos uh, to just kind of slap. I use these in a percussive way more so than in a pitched way, even though you can still kind of make out some pitches to it, but it works really well in a percussive type of application. Okay, so those are the four short notes that I wanna start talking about. Next, we have some uh, some other more specialized type articulations, and uh, this is very, very, uh, very common, but the tremolo, and I wanna, I wanna make sure that we define tremolo versus trill. A tremolo, happens when the bow is moved back and forth in very, very short distances. That is the tremolo. Okay. And uh, depending on how loud you use it, if you use it really aggressively, But it also can work really well at low velocities. Just a little bit, a little bit of tension. That can be really, really nice. So that is the tremolo, not to be confused with a trill. And a trill is when you move between notes. So there's the major second trill, which would be going from, like if I'm holding an A, would be going from an A natural to a B natural. Versus a minor second, which would be an A natural to a B flat. So obviously the major second feels a little bit more <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Versus the minor second. just sounds a little bit darker, a little bit more anxious, if you will. Uh, and so those are the two trills. So a tremolo is the note moving back and forth, one, one note moving back and forth. The minor second trill is a minor second interval. And the major second is a major second interval. And it's usually, I'm guessing I'm not a, a violinist, but it's a hammer, like a hammer on kind of thing, I guess. And, and the note moving and the bow moving really, really fast. Okay, next we have the long soltasto, which is an even smaller, more intimate sounding um, tone than the flautando. And this is when the, the, the violinist or the string player has bowed over the fingerboard. All right, so it's called Sol Tasto. All right, next we have harmonics and harmonics. Well, let's do a short harmonic first so you can kind of hear the harmonics. All right, so if you lightly touch any string, uh, whether it's a guitar, a ukulele, or a violin, cello, whatever, you can touch the string at different nodal points up and down the string and essentially divide the string either in half or in thirds or in quarters or in fifths, and this creates a, uh, a pinch point that will separate the note. Okay, so you are, you are, if you're looking at the string kind of waving, you're introducing a node and then making the string wave or vibrate at a different focal point. And this creates harmonics, usually an octave or higher over what, what is generally 
played. So like if you on a guitar hold down lightly at the octave, then you will get a, an octave, I believe, above that note. So these are really high and just lightly touched. And so we have short harmonics and long harmonics. All right. And so harmonics, any stringed instrument can play harmonics. Next, we have the Bartok pizzicato. And the pizzicato is when you pluck it so hard, like a regular pitz, but you pluck it so hard that it actually slaps, the, the string slaps back against the fingerboard. And so it's just a very aggressive, very, very hard sound. To be honest, I don't use Bartok pizzas a ton <laughs> in uh, like dramedy cues. It's just a, a, a lot more angry sounding. Next up, we have these long marcato attack notes here in BBCSO. And what marcato is, is, is it's somewhere in between long sustained sounds and staccato. It's just, it's usually an emphasis. It's added at the beginning of a note and uh, marcato notes don't always hold for a long time. They're just long notes that have a beginning and an end. Now here, these long marcato attacks add accents at the beginning. So it's a little push. And so you can hear it push really hard and then immediately come back. So lastly, let's look at a few last of these articulations. First, starting with the tremolo solpon, which is like the tremolo, but solpon, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that solpon, solpon, uh, I'm pronouncing it French, uh, is played closer to the bridge. versus the regular tremolo. Right, so you can see it's it's a little it's a little scratchier, a little drier. And then we have a tremolo with the consordino. Which is the same tremolo as or, or the same articulation or with the mute. So that consordino is with the mute. So it's a tremolo with the mute. Next, we have long solpon notes. Okay. So sol ponticello. So it's close to the bridge. So compare that to the saltasto. Compare that to the regular longs. To the consordino. Yeah, it sounds almost filtered, doesn't it? And the flautando. So giving you a lot of different ways to voice the same the same thing. Here's the sol, sol pont back. Yeah, it's just kind of thin and scratchy. And then finally, spiccato consordino. versus the spiccato, regular. Back to the consordino. So those are the basic string articulations that I think we as 
MIDI composers need to understand. There are more articulations that go uh, beyond this, but depending on the string library you're using, you're going to find more than likely some kind of variation of these types of articulations, especially um, staccato, pizzicato, spiccato, uh, maybe some flautandos and some uh, consordinos. Uh, the others, maybe some colinio, but more advanced string articulations. You have to get into a, a deep string library that that is looking to offer a lot of realism. And each of these has their own uh, music musical symbol that goes into sheet music. But uh, considering that we don't really get into at least in my world, writing a ton of sheet music for the, the cues that we're writing, then um, this is this is all I really need, to, to be honest. So let's go through, with that done, let's check out some brass articulations. So I've got a horn loaded up here, uh, AKA a French horn. And so we have the legato, which just like the string legato is a single lined instrument. So I, I can't I can't play chords, even though I'm holding three notes now, I'm only hearing one at a time. And with brass instruments, especially the horn, you can really hear the legato transition, that sound from note one to note two. You hear the little, like almost like a little lip. There's like a little, just a, it's like a, a, it's, it's the shape of the player's mouth changing and changing keys. And so that is the legato. And then we have the other articulations, the longs, which is going to not have the legato transitions. And these can sound kind of fake. And what makes them sound fake, especially if you're using a horn library that doesn't have legato transitions, if you try to play a horn line, versus a legato. That sounds so much better versus. It, again, it works as, as pads. But as a single line, not so much. So anytime you would have a single line, then you would want to use the legato because it sounds much more realistic. There is staccatissimo, which is a very short, sharp note. And you really have to dig into those. And then we get into the marcato, which is an accented short note that has a strong front end. You hear how that ends? It hits and then backs off. And next we have a cuivre. I don't know, my, uh, my high school French has, has been a really long time, but this is uh, an extra brassy sound. So that's really nice. It's just really splatty and very, very brassy. Again, you would not try to use this as a single line. You would use the legato. Next, we have a long that has a sforzando at the at the beginning, which is a 
which is a strong attack and then immediately backs off. So you could do. Okay. Then the next articulation is a flutter tongue. And a flutter tongue is something that wind instruments can do. And it's basically, well, if, if you don't know, what, what, what tonguing a note is, is if as you're blowing air, you would say like a ta or a t, you would go tu, 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 tu. And that creates a little interruption of the air that puffs the air and uh, it creates an articulation called tonguing. Uh, you can double tongue, which is you going takata, 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 takata. And we have the multi-tongue here, which does that. But we also have the flutter tongue. And what the flutter tongue is, is basically the wind, uh, wind player doing the drum roll sound, and you get. Yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah, it's not, not the most practical or the most uh, applicable sound, but that's what flutter tonguing is. And, and again, double tonguing or multi tonguing. Takata, takata, and wind players can double tongue a lot. Like if you've ever uh, like heard the William Tell overture, um, that's all double tonguing. They're not going. That's double tonguing or multi tonguing. And then, just like with the stringed instruments, we have a major second trill. And we have a minor second trill. We have a long note with a mute. We have a staccatissimo muted, which has a mute put into it, usually a rubber mute or another type of mute. Um, now, now horns, usually w the, the player will mute with their hand or they can actually put like a rubber mute in. The trumpet has many different types of mutes that, that affect their sound. And then we have marcato muted. Okay, so one of the things to note about brass instruments as you are playing is the sound is darker the lower the volume is. Let me say that depending on what your library or how, how it's programmed, it might be the either the, through the velocities or it might be through modulation or expression. And if you've, you've seen... Um, you see this moving around. If you've been, uh, if you're watching this on on YouTube, you can see this little knob here moving around, or the slider. And I'm doing that. I have a, a pedal underneath my desk, and you will notice if you listen to the sound, it sounds really kind of dark. And the louder it gets, like the brassier it gets, for, for lack of a better term. And what we're seeing is we're seeing harmonics open up in the sound. All right, so if I, if I play this really quietly, and I am going to, I'm going to kind of pull up my, my meter there. And as it gets louder, yes, the volume is getting louder, but you can see additional overtones start popping up. So that brassy sound that you hear, is the harmonic series, and the, or, or I should say the overtone series, really blowing up. And let me move this so you can actually see the mod wheel. Now, 
Did you hear that legato transition was a little weird? You hear that? That's the legato transition, not really firing. So Spitfire, if you're watching, that is, uh, was that E1? <laughs> that is, uh, e, I'm sorry, E3. Uh, E3 down to, to D, D2. Sounds, sounds a little weird. Now that's a giant octave. That's a leap of a ninth. Anyway, we're not we're not necessarily here to uh, to litigate this, but this is a really important aspect to understand about brass instruments and finding good brass libraries that don't just sound splatty and big the whole time. Like if we were to play this cuivre, it just sounds really splatty. Like regardless of the volume, like you can hear, if I lower the, the mod wheel way down, looking at the meters, you can see all of these overtones still there. And it just makes it kind of louder versus the legato. And then you can see the overtones really, really blooming out of that. So those are the brass articulations. And then finally, let's talk about some woodwind articulations. Now, a lot of these will be the same. Uh, I've got a clarinet dialed up here and, uh, and we could, I mean, <laughs> we could get into additional like multiphonics and all of that kind of stuff, but just keep it super simple right now. Uh, we have the legato. You have the long sounds, which which sounds kind of fake because you don't have the benefit of those legato transitions. But you can also play chords with these patches. Let me do a, a different a different voicing here. but you would not play single lines. You would use legato. All right, then you have your major second trills. You have your minor second trills. You have your staccatissimo, which are really short. And then we have tenuto. And tenuto are kind of like staccato, but they're a little bit more rounded. All right. Then you have marcato, which is those uh, shorter notes with accents. You have long flutter tonguing. Then you have multi-tonguing or double-tonguing. Yeah, I mean, I find this articulation to be a little, little suspect uh, just because it's, it's kind of... And maybe, maybe I haven't used it enough, but it, it, yeah, as far as timing and everything gets a little suspect. Now, you'll notice there is, uh, or there are no mutes because you don't really mute a, a clarinet because it is an open instrument. Now, I don't have a clarinet here, but I do have my uh, shakuhachi. And as you blow into it, you know, uh, as a woodwind instrument, then uh, the air escapes through the hole. So putting a mute, you know, at the bottom doesn't really, doesn't really accomplish anything. Uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, I, I mentioned multiphonics, and I think it, it would be worth at least looking at what multiphonics are. So let me uh, let me load up uh, an instance of Project Sam's Symphobia because they have a really good woodwind uh, effects library. So I have Symphobia One pulled up here, and there is something really cool that woodwinds can do really well, which is called multiphonics. Yeah. 
and, and basically, you know, the the way that woodwinds work, especially reeded instruments, is you have a mouthpiece that has a wooden reed on it, like a like a clarinet has a single reed, an oboe and a bassoon, an English horn has a double reed, which is two little slats of wood kind of pushed together, uh, and uh, related to like the duduk, which has two pieces of, uh, of, of reed kind of put together. And if you kind of pinch the reed with your mouth and blow extra hard and create all this back pressure, you can create some really interesting sound effects. Those sound really, really good, especially if you drench it in reverb. I mean, that, that sounds like straight out of Jurassic Park. And this is one of the reasons I really like Symphobia. That's, that's gnarly. Is Symphobia brings all these really kind of advanced articulations uh, to the table that I think work really, really, really well. So those are multiphonics and come in really handy with like trailer and modern, maybe even other kind of horror type type of cues or whatever. So there you have it. That was a ju- uh, just a really broad overview of the different type of articulations you're likely to find when you start working with your virtual instruments. Now, like I said, different libraries have different articulations baked in and how those are manipulated, whether it's through the modulation or through velocities or through the expression tool, different different libraries will, will tackle that differently. But the, the ultimate goal here, and why we're even talking about this, is if we are looking to create as believable performance as we can with our virtual instruments, then we have to get in there and start adjusting these articulations. Because players do. Live players can effortlessly go from spiccato to staccato to flautando to legato and just moving all around. And so, yes, it's time consuming. Yes, it is somewhat fiddly, especially if you're getting into like key switches and all this kind of thing. And it could be a real pain. But uh, just this morning, I was having a one-on-one session with a student uh, and I said, like, like, one of his superpowers is massaging all of these little articulations, and he creates amazingly realistic performances out of his virtual instruments. And yes, it does feel like an archaeologist taking a little tiny brush and just barely sweeping away the dust to to uncover this, you know, the skeleton or whatever. And it, it, there's forensic level of detail to it, but I think that it pays off. So knowing these articulations, knowing how to use them is super important to creating realistic and vital, vital to creating realistic MIDI performances. So I hope that was helpful. What are some articulations that you like? And do you have some libraries that do even more than what we looked at here between BBCSO and Symphobia? I would love to know. Please let me know in the description below. Now, we're going to take a quick break, and I'm going to tell you how you can join 52Qs and also support us and get extra perks like live streams and all these other kind of things. But when we return, we're going to be taking a listen to my latest cue, which is called Obfuscating on Thin Ice. 
Every week I talk about how this episode and the podcast and the community, the channel would not be possible without the amazing support of our family, friends, and neighbors, subscribers of 52Qs, who do pay their actual real life money to keep all of this going. And in addition to being thriving members of the community, as well as supporting me and Shannon and everything that we're doing here, they also receive extra perks like live streams, workshops, Zoom feedback sessions, hundreds and hundreds of hours of video archives, weekly cue breakdowns, production music almanac, uh, living ebook, and the opportunities to submit to real music libraries. Now, it's free to join 52Qs. You can just go to 52Qs.com and sign up, be a member of the community. We would love to have you. It will always be free to join the community. But if you've been watching, or if maybe this is your first time, but if you're wondering, is there a way to kind of level up my production music skills in the industry, meeting like-minded, super friendly, very generous composers, then why don't you think about subscribing? Membership start at around four bucks a month and we would love to have you. Again, that's 52Qs.com. That was obfuscating on thin ice, little quirky hip hoppy dramedy cue for a library that I am working on. I think I have one more of those, so we might we might be hearing another dramedy cue here in, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but uh, for you family and friends subscribers, you can check out a complete breakdown of this cue, including the sounds that I used, the harmonic choices, and what I did to get that melodica to sound like a quirky broken down B3 organ that is hanging out right now over in the Q breakdown sections at 52 Qs. But that is going to do it for me this week. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining me. You want to tune in next week where I am going to be joined by the winner of our recent What's Your Superpower Composer Quest, Mr. Nathan Toft. We're gonna to listen to his award-winning his award-winning cue, and uh, we are going to talk about his career and how he how he went from like trombone performance to being an elementary school teacher, and how he uses his superpower of tromboning and uh, uses it in really really interesting ways. So you definitely want to tune in for that next week. But but yeah, once again, thank you so much for joining me. I really, really appreciate you. Uh, get whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the audio on the go, just know that, uh, that I thank you for spending part of your day here with me. So I hope you've had a fantastic week 28, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing amazing things about your week 29. Why is that, folks? And how do I know that it's going to be amazing? Because I know, trust, and believe that the universe has amazing plans just for you. Until next time, peace. 
The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2024 818 Studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the community or becoming a member subscriber of 52 Cues, head over to 52Cues.com.